Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to Black Hawk Down, The Battle of Mogadishu 1993 Part 1. And I'm going to be 100% honest, I have absolutely no idea about any of this. Where even is Mo Mogadishu? I mean, I should... I swear it's famous for something, but I don't know. Capital of Somalia. Okay, I wouldn't have guessed that, to be fair. Okay, I mean, I, mean, I know there's a lot of stuff... A lot of things that happen now in Somalia. I swear it's now split up into two countries, Somalia and Somaliland. Like I know a bit, and I know there's like it's a very unsafe country. I think Somaliland is a bit safer. I don't know. I'm probably not talking about anything that I should be talking about because I don't know what I'm saying. But I've done. I've just sort of watched videos in the past about people traveling to Somaliland. I think. And I think it's a bit safer than Somalia or the other way around. But yeah, I know there's a lot of stuff that happens in that that's happened in this country and still going on. Like there's a lot of unsafe people. I don't know. There's just terrorist organizations and stuff like that. And it's really sad for the people who live there who are like obviously growing up and they have no control. But yeah, I don't really know what I'm talking about with this. I've never looked into this case as opposed to Desert Storm, which I've never like learned about. But you sort of, it's just one of those things, you know what happened with like, Saddam Hussein and the US like it's just a well-known war but this one it probably is as well known but for me I've never seen it before so it's all new for, like completely new but it's from the same channel that I've been reacting to recently and I've been asking for more reactions from this channel and yeah this is the one that I found so we'll react to this now I don't know how many parts of this there are but hey I don't know it's still something to learn about but yeah if you want to see some more of my reactions links are in the description to my patreon if you want to see things that i can't post to youtube for whatever reason it's there so yeah you can find it through the links in the description but we're going to check this out and see what happened here because i'm genuinely clueless to all of this as i've mentioned 10 times now but let's jump into this This is Romeo 64 to all elements. Irene, Irene, Irene. Oh damn, the graphics are even better. All right, I'll let him actually talk now. I guess he's sort of talking from the perspective of someone. Elements, Irene, Irene, Irene. With the launch code issued, the Earth rumbles as the armada of helicopters lift off the ground and head out. Somali spotters near the airport radio ahead to warn that the Americans are on their way. As they fly out over the airport perimeter towards the ocean, a convoy of nine Humvees and three five-ton trucks leave the base and head towards the city. It's 3.35pm. The raiding force should be in and out in 30 minutes. Somalia is in civil war, with multiple parties and clans violently competing for power. UN troops have been deployed to the country to maintain peace and ensure the distribution of food supplies to the people. The UN brings about a settlement between the factions to lay down their arms and move towards national unity and democracy. One faction, the Somali National Alliance, or SNA, despite signing the agreement, ignores it, and attacks UN troops in the area in June 1993. The US deploys Task Force Ranger to Mogadishu Airport, a special forces group made up of Rangers, SEALs, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, and a company from the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta. So they sent pretty much the the big dogs to help, I assume. Like the people who are trained the most for these specific situations. Also known as Delta Force. Task Force Ranger, or TFR, are here to find and kill or capture the leader of the SNA, General Mohamed Farah Idid. The SNA is predominantly made up of Idid's own clan, a form of family tribal structure, the Harbrigadier, and it is hoped that toppling Idid will halt the violence. Task Force Ranger launches raids into Mogadishu to capture Idid, but have so far been unsuccessful. In July 1993, American Cobra attack helicopters launch rockets and cannon fire into a building they believe to be hosting a meeting between Idid and his war council. Idid isn't present and an American war correspondent reports that the meeting was actually between Somali elders discussing routes to peace. Oh. With 200 casualties inside the building, the SNA sees the opportunity to promote anti- See, this is the sad thing because so many things, like, you know, like, it's, if you've got, like, if you can just use your brain, you know 
they're here for the reasons of trying to protect their people but you'll see things like this and obviously it's not on purpose but you'll see things like this and then it will give other people the perspective rightly or wrongly i mean from their perspective they can believe what they want of they they're not here to just bring peace or whatever and he's i guess he's now going to say they're going to use this as a way to make the us look worse or a lot worse because that's a thing that could definitely do that it's a sad situation that because you hear what they're actually there to do and it's the people were there for the complete opposite and it's just sad but flipping hell war is tough man i mean obviously i know I'm, i i know this but like you see things like this like you you're given these um options that you have to do quick you don't like have time to think about what to do and it leads to awful things like this happening but man that is sad the american sentiment and propaganda in the city Fury at the American's presence builds in Mogadishu, and four Western journalists covering the story are killed by an angry mob. What? On the 3rd of October 1993, Task Force Ranger receives a tip-off of the location of an SNA meeting in the city, with ID's Foreign Minister Omar Salad el Meem and his top political advisor Mohammed Hassan Awali in attendance. With just two hours notice, TFR prepares and launches a raid to snatch them both hoping this will bring them closer to IDs himself. The plan is for AH-6 Littlebirds to land the Delta Force teams on the street outside the target building containing El Meem and Awali, and they will storm the building. Meanwhile, four Ranger Chalks, squads of 15 men, will fast rope down from hovering Blackhawks to each corner of the block surrounding the target building and establish a perimeter. Okay. Once the prisoners are secured, the Humvee and truck convoy led by Lieutenant Colonel Danny McKnight will roll in front of the target building, load the entire raiding force and prisoners on board, and exfil back to base before ID's militia can mobilise against them. All the while, the Blackhawks and Littlebirds will circle around to provide air cover. A command and control Blackhawk directs the forces, and a combat search and rescue helicopter is ready to react to any problems should they arise. For more substantial problems, the 10th Mountain Division are on standby as a quick reaction force at their base in the west of the city. The peacekeeping UN Pakistani and Malaysian troops and armour are not on standby, but occupy the new port area of the city in the south. The whole plan should take 30 minutes to complete. With an EP-3 Orion and an OH-58 Kiowa circling overhead providing a live video feed to overall commander General Garrison, the helicopters scream in towards the target building in the area of the Olympic Hotel to begin the assault. Tires are burning around the city. With US forces jamming radio signals, the tire burning is a signal to the SNA militia throughout the city that the Americans are coming. AH-6 Littlebirds, armed with miniguns and rocket pods, lead the way up Holwadig Road to spot any armed Somalis, and with the coast clear, the MH6s throw up a dust storm as they land with precision in front of the target building. Delta Force operators, nicknamed D-Boys, hop off the benches and move into the target building. The time is 3.42pm. The four Ranger Chalks begin fast roping down from hovering Blackhawks to the street 60 feet below. The Chalks form L-shaped defensive positions on each corner of the block, except for Chalk 4 who have accidentally been dropped a block further away. This is the first time out as the leader of Chalk 4, the Staff Sergeant Matt Eversman, and in his Chalk, the first ever combat mission for 18-year-old Private Todd Blackburn, fresh in from high school and boot camp. Oh my days, no way. 18, bro, when I was 18, I wasn't even, I mean, I just started my YouTube channel. No, I wasn't even 18 at that point, I don't think. I was, I was 18 when I started it, but my life was not in place, and this this kid is here in this moment you have got to be kidding me man that is insane but having not yet been to ranger school for whatever reason <coughs> likely excitement and adrenaline blackburn completely misses the rope as he exits the aircraft and falls 60 feet to the ground Aww. medics run to attend to him the raid is taking place close to the bakara market an ID'd controlled area of the city with a high concentration of SNA militia. That close. With the pre-warning that the raid was coming, hundreds of militia are organised, armed and waiting. 
Fire begins to erupt on the rangers from all directions. SNA runners move out across the city to mobilise militia further afield, who begin to arm themselves, mount up on trucks, and head in the direction of the helicopters circling above the city. However, as the SNA are only using runners on foot, 30 minutes should be plenty of time for the raiding force to exfil from the area before the city swarms in. Medics stabilise Blackburn, but with the fire raining down on them, a helicopter evacuation is out of the question. They'll have to wait for the convoy. Oh, Rocket propelled grenades RPGs, are now being fired at the defending rangers. A crowd of unarmed locals are also forming around the raid site. The situation is manageable, but the strength of the resistance is much higher than expected. While the Delta operators move through the target building, the Humvee convoy arrives on the street outside and waits for them to complete their work. Eversman orders five men in his chalk to move Blackburn over to the waiting vehicles. Chalk 2's M60 machine gunner, Sean Nelson, can see a larger crowd, numbering in the thousands, forming further down the street he's monitoring. Holy shit. He spots an armed group following a man, confidently riding a cow out into the street in front of him, wielding an AK. He opens fire on the man, and the rest of the group scatter. Just at that moment, a Black Hawk sweeps overhead and looses blistering fire on the street below with its minigun. The group, and the cow, don't last long. Poor cow. Another group of 15 Somalis approach, some are armed and using the unarmed amongst them as human shields. He first tries to aim just at the man. No way, such cowardly fucking behaviour. And using the unarmed amongst them as human shields. He first tries to aim just at the militia, but with Nelson and the rest of Chalk 2 taking fire from the group, he weighs the decision and decides he has no choice but to open fire on all of them. Man, that is so depressing. Now, this is, this is war, man. These situations... They, now, like, you can see why this affects so many people's mental state when they come back from these wars and when they come back from these battles and this stuff because, you like... You're given this split decision and before you know it you've made the right one or the wrong one or the right one for the situation but then it's something that's going to affect you because you know you've hurt innocent people but it's like it's just i don't know it's just so many things to really comprehend but it's so cowardly so cowardly from them just to use unarmed people as shields like jeez man and i guess that sort of stuff's gonna bolster their sort of belief into making the the US or whoever else is fighting against these terrorists to make the US and the, the UN look even worse, you know, but... The group scatters, leaving armed and unarmed dead. Seeing this, a larger group of militia and unarmed locals charge at Chalk 2. This time, without time to think about it, the Chalk returns fire. At that moment, a little bird marauds down the street above their heads and inflicts a devastating minigun run on the crowd. Perfect timing again. The display of awesome firepower disperses any survivors. All four chalks are now being forced into the tough decision to open fire on militia who are using unarmed people as human shields. Man. From the perspective of the locals who are just arriving at the scene, they see the Americans indiscriminately firing on civilians, and the fury of the citizens grows further. The hornet's nest has been stirred. Lieutenant Colonel McKnight sends three Humvees to carry critically injured Blackburn back to base immediately. The journey should only take five minutes, but they've driven into the storm. They turn onto National Street to find militia on both sides firing into them, with stray rounds into each other as they drive through. Paulson, manning the 50 calibre machine gun on the lead Humvee fires right, and Pillar in the second fires left. In the furious torrent of fire, Pillar is killed instantly by a round to the forehead. Mate. In that moment, fighting for their lives and with RPGs now flying down the street at them, a call comes over the radio from Sergeant Gallagher, a platoon sergeant with the main force at the target building. How are you guys doing? Taking heavy fire, Struker shouts, I don't want to talk about it. Unsatisfied, Gallagher calls again. Have you got any casualties? Yeah, one. Struker replies, deliberately short. Who is he and what's his status? It's Pillar. And what's his status? He's dead. The busy radio network falls to silence. The first, but not the last, TFR trooper has lost his life. 
Sustaining further injuries, Struka's Humvees continue to fight their way back to the airport. The Delta boys have apprehended the two targets and a further 22 SNA prisoners and are loading them into the trucks. It's now nearly 40 minutes after the first boots landed. The process of clearing the building and processing the prisoners is taking longer than expected. There is also confusion with the Delta team waiting for the comms from the convoy to leave the building and the convoy waiting for the Delta team to let them know that they've apprehended the prisoners. Every minute the mob grows stronger but the rangers and circling helicopters are so far keeping them at bay. Chalk 4 rangers Galantine and Berenson take non-critical hits, with Galantine losing a finger. Chief Warrant Officers Cliff Elvis Walcott and Donovan Bull Briley, pilots of Super 6-1, continue to manoeuvre their helicopter at low level above the action, their crew chiefs discharging thousands of rounds from their miniguns at the militia below and four Delta snipers picking off the enemy through the open doors. On the first day of the Ground War of Desert Storm, Walcott had been one of the pilots to fly Special Forces deep into Iraq to recon Saddam's forces. He is a legend in the Special Operations community. During a turn to port, starboard gunner Staff Sergeant Warren spots a militiaman with an RPG below him. Hey, I've got a guy with an RPG. He's at 5 o'clock, moving to 6 o'clock. Sergeant Randy, the portside gunner, can't spot the man as the helicopter continues the turn. Is he by a building or something you can describe? Before Warren can respond, the RPG round flashes skyward and hits the tail of Super 6-1. The Black Hawk enters an uncontrollable spin. Oh my days. The Rangers of Chalk 2 hear the impact. This whole situation is, you've been thrown in the most hostile place, a hostile situation. Like all the other reactions that I've done are insane. Like. The situations that these people get in are, I can't comprehend, but this just, they've been thrown so far in the deep end, I'm sort of looking at this, I'm like, how can they get out of this? Like, it's just crazy how they're literally thrown into this, and there's all these people that were prepared to fight and attack you, and they're actually getting really like, I mean, I'm looking at this now, and I'm thinking, could they get overwhelmed? I'm assuming they don't, because... They'll just find a way to get, and they've all got all this manpower that will be sent in the case of that. But they're so outnumbered, it's crazy. And watch in horror as one and of their gun. own helicopters spins erratically around the sky, smoke trailing from its tail. The radio net erupts in panicked calls. We got a Black Hawk going down. We got a Black Hawk going down. Delta operator Sergeant Smith isn't wearing his seatbelt and desperately holds onto a crew seat the spin pulling his legs outside the door of the aircraft oh as it descends. My God. He took an RPG, 6-1 is going down. In the cockpit, Walcott coolly and in a banterous fashion asks his co-pilot, hey Bull, you gonna pull the PCLs offline or what? <laughs> a procedure to attempt to control the spin. Wow. It's no use, and still maintaining his composure, Walcott makes one last radio transmission, 6-1 going down. The Black Hawk clips a roof and plows into the street below rolling over onto its side in a ball of dust and debris. Both pilots are killed instantly. Mate. It is later deemed likely that Walcott deliberately pitched the helicopter's nose down at the last second, ensuring that the pilots absorbed the impact, saving the lives of the crew in the back. Nah, that is... Mate, what the hell? Oh, man. Genuinely, that is incredible. Like, humans are selfish. You're not gonna... A lot of people are not going to do that. And you've literally just sacrificed your life to save, to potentially save at that point, because you don't know if they're going to survive, but to potentially save all the crew um, that aren't the pilots. Like, mate, flipping hell, man. This is the craziest reaction I've done to one of these animated series, for sure. This, like, I'm just... Sort of, these are the sort of things that you see in, like, Call of Duty, right? But Call of Duty won't obviously do it justice, because, like, in Call of Duty, you're like you'll survive after killing thousands of people and like you're this invincible thing but it's sort of you you get you get put into these situations where like in like the campaign mode where you're just like yeah this doesn't happen you're seeing this this is the literally out of the campaign but 10 times scarier and like hot like just worse in general like this is just mental to me the command and control bird above orders all available nearby rangers to push to the crash site chalk 2 is nearest so eight of the 15 rangers in that chalk move out on foot into the city. 
just eight. The convoy is ordered to prepare to move to the crash site immediately. A message is sent to the quick reaction force of the 10th Mountain Division to mobilize for the massive Are these all crowds coming towards them? fight that is about to take place. I think they are. Idid is not to be underestimated. He was educated in Rome before postgraduate study in military science at the Frunz Military Academy in the Soviet Union. He has carefully studied the Soviet campaign in Afghanistan in the 1980s and found that guerrilla forces were successful in bringing down Soviet attack helicopters with shoulder-launched RPGs. His battle plan with the Americans is to draw them deep into his territory in the city and then swarm the area with RPGs, bring mm. down a helicopter and then collapse the city around the troops on the ground, overrunning them in the chaos. Super 6-1's shootdown is no accident. Of the surviving two crew and four Delta operators, only two are not seriously injured. Having just survived a brutal helicopter crash, Sergeants Bush and Smith emerge and defend themselves and the rest of the survivors from the now arriving locals. Mate! Littlebird Star 4-1 is the first help to arrive at the crash scene. They land near the alley and are immediately charged at by Somalis. The two pilots, Warrant Officers Jones and Meyer, defend themselves from the cockpit with pistol fire. Jones hops out and moves to the wreckage just as Lieutenant Di Tommaso arrives with the seven other members of Chalk 2 to form a defensive perimeter. They find that Bush has been killed defending the survivors. They move his body into the little bird and Sergeant Smith also hops on board. Man. Super 6-1 pilots Walcott and Briley are dead and the rest of the survivors require medical attention before they can be evacuated. Littlebird Star 4-1 lifts off and heads back to base. The How have you gone from a, a helicopter crash, you've survived it, and now you're instantly just fighting, defending the people that have been injured, and obviously one of them was killed through that, so like, just constant barrages of hell, like, you just constantly, you can't stop, you just have to keep going, and it's just like, oh man, I just repeat myself, but seeing this, I can't imagine how fast thinking you'd have had to be in these situations. You're so outnumbered, like unbelievably outnumbered in a territory that you don't understand, you don't know. And these are people that all live here. They know the ins and outs of this place. Like Everything is, the odds are all stacked so against you. And even though you've got all this air superiority and you have all these incredible weapons that can, I don't know, like 10 times better than what they have, than the Somali and guerrilla forces have. But still, it's just like, in these situations, I can't even understand how they can get out of them. The convoy rolls up to Sergeant Eversman's Chalk 4, and under heavy fire they get in. People now line the streets, roofs and windows, firing down into them. Jeez. They turn right towards the crash site, but, disoriented, the lead Humvee then turns south, now heading away from the crash site. Ranger Commander Captain Steele orders the remaining Chalks and Delta operators to move on foot towards the crash. They encounter heavy resistance. Delta Sergeant Fillmore is killed en route. With one less Blackhawk in the low orbit roll covering troops on the ground, the command and control bird radios Chief Warrant Officer Mike Durant in Super 64, loitering to the north of the city. Super 64, this is Alpha 51. Come up and join Super 62 in his orbit. 64 is inbound. Durant heads south towards the city. The combat search and rescue Blackhawk Super 68 arrives at the crash site, and the team of Rangers and D Boys begin to fast rope down to the street below. With men still on the rope, the helicopter is hit by an RPG. In a display of superb airmanship, pilots Dan Gelotta and Herb Rodriguez hold the helicopter steady while the men complete their fast rope. Mate. They ascend from the area and successfully manage to put their stricken aircraft down at the friendly Newport area in the south. No way. Under heavy fire, the CSAR team moves the two remaining wounded crew chiefs to a nearby shelter. They then move to strengthen the perimeter set up by Chalk 2 at the intersection just west of the crash. The convoy is lost. Under heavy fire, they can't afford to slow down, but it's taking time to relay directions to the crash site from the aircraft above McKnight. The locals are now building makeshift roadblocks throughout the area, using tables, chairs and general debris. Jeez. Fearing bombs planted inside the roadblocks, the Humvees can't simply drive through them. 
they make several wrong turns and loop around the area of the target building. Ten minutes after Walcott Super 6-1 went down, Durant Super 6-4 is on station over the rooftops providing minigun fire support for the Humvees below. At 4.40pm, Durant's Blackhawk takes an RPG hit to the Another. tail section. He pulls the aircraft out of the orbit and points southwest towards the airport. It's leaking oil, but the controls are still responding, and he believes they can make it back. All of a sudden, the tail rotor gearbox and most of the tail itself completely disintegrates. The Blackhawk enters a violent spin. He radios, Super 6-4 going in hard, we're going down. Just before hitting with the ground, the pilots manage to level off the chopper, and as it impacts with the earth, the helicopter lands flat on its belly. This is crucial, and as a result, the crew survive. What? Blackhawk Super 6-2 circles the crash site, and immediately spots a mob of people moving towards it from all directions. They can see the convoy still driving around lost in the city. To the west, Struker's three Humvees that had earlier evacuated Private Blackburn back to the airport have now rearmed, and with a volunteer force of Cooks, Clarks, and injured Rangers, are attempting to fight their way back into the city, but are pinned down. Delta Snipers Sergeants Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon, on board Super 62, can see for themselves that Super 64 will shortly be overrun, and that both convoys are nowhere near. They volunteer to deploy on the ground to defend the crash site. At first, Harold and Matthews in the Command and Control Bird reject the request, but after discussion, they agree that they have no choice, and if anyone can hold off the mob, Delta Force operators, the elite of the US military, might be the only chance to save the crew of Super 64. Shugart and Gordon are inserted on the ground nearby, and make their way to the crash site. There's they find that just two. All four crewmen have survived the crash. The Delta operators carefully move Durant to a tree next to a shack on the right side of the downed helicopter. His back and leg are broken. They hand him his MP5K submachine gun, before moving to the other side of the Blackhawk to face the incoming mob. Oh my god. To his left is an alleyway. Durant covers- These people are so insane! Oh my god, this is flipping mental! There's two of them fighting how many people? Jeez, this is just... Oh my god. Is there footage of any of this stuff? I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I want to see it, but is there footage of any of this stuff? Like, I don't know. I don't know how, but it's just if there is, like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying to honest, but like, I just can't comprehend what's really happening here. ...their backs by firing on any Somali that emerges. Super 6-2, the helicopter that had dropped Shugart and Gordon on the second crash site, is now circling overhead opening fire on the armed crowd bearing down on the crash site. The RPG fire up at them is intense, and nearby helicopters warn Super 6-2 of how close the explosions are getting. With snipers on nearby little birds also firing down on the crowd, oh the mob God. is being kept at bay. Okay. But it doesn't last. On the ground, Durant hears Gary Gordon cry out in pain from the other side of the helicopter. After a few seconds, Shugart brings Gordon's weapon to Durant, loaded and ready to fire. Above them, Super 6-2's pilot Mike Gafina sees Gordon has been killed and radios a desperate plea. This is Super 6-2. Ground element crash site number 2 has no security right now. They have one guy on the ground. Are there any nearby ground forces moving to crash site 2 at this time? Negative, not at this time. Oh my god. RPGs continue to flash up towards Super 6-2 and finally one connects on the starboard side of the aircraft. His co-pilot and one of the Delta snipers in the back are heavily wounded in the blast. Gafina has almost no control over the aircraft and somehow manages to crash land it in the Newport area to the south. The miniguns of Super 62 are no longer raining lead from above and after an hour of desperate fighting, Shugart runs out of ammunition. The mob finally overruns Super 64. Three of the four crewmen and snipers Gordon and Shugart are all killed. The angry locals are in the process of beating Durant to death Jesus. when his life is spared by an SNA member who decides to take him to IDED as a prisoner. Shugart and Gordon would later be awarded posthumous medals of honour. Poor people. The man. This is this is honestly the hardest reaction I've done, man. 
This is so fucking crazy. I can't understand how, how like how scary the situation would have really been. And he was just there fighting, just fighting nonstop. The only thing that stopped him was running out of an, 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 ammunition. Flipping hell, man. Boy is taking a hammering in the city, with 50% of the troops inside the vehicles now having suffered gunshots or shrapnel wounds. Struker's Humvees are unable to fight their way back in. Two Blackhawks have been shot down, another two have been damaged by RPG hits, and most of the others are riddled with bullet holes. Chalks 1, 2 and 3 are taking casualties on foot fighting 2 and defending Crash Site 1. The mission launched at 3.35pm and was supposed to take 30 minutes. The fight will continue throughout the night, and the troops on the ground are running out of water and ammunition and didn't bring night vision equipment. Oh. The situation is bleak. But the 10th Mountain Division is mobilising. If the Rangers and Delta operators on the ground can hold out into the night, 100 Malaysian and Pakistani tanks and armoured vehicles with US Humvees can launch a large-scale armoured assault into the city. The time is now 5.40pm. The rescue convoy won't move out until 11.30pm. They're in the fight of their lives. Jeez. And then I guess that's what part two is for. This is... Oh my days. This, in this is incredible, man. Feels like we're in a drone actually watching... No, honestly, it's crazy how... And also, you can tell the level up in terms of the graphics and stuff, but the storytelling and everything, mate. This, this channel is really, really, like, top class, man. I love that the cow was classified as an unarmed casualty. The two pilots were having a having a ban as the chopper went down. When, what absolute kings. 835, one of the most selfless heroic acts I've ever heard of. When I first saw this scene in Black Hawk Down, I was so... Oh, there's this... Or will shortly... Is there a, f film, about, a film about this? Because this is something that I feel like would be... Definitely turned into a film. I'm almost certain it was, but... I don't know. But I mean, yeah, this was crazy. So there's obviously part two. I'm going to just press it. I'm going to react to it soon. So yeah, it's just part one and part two. Yeah, I guess I'll react to this tomorrow, I assume. But um, man, this was hard. I don't know if how the outcome will be of this. But if there's anyone who was involved in this watching this reaction, I mean, my salute is out there for you because I, mate, it's just these are pl positions that I don't expect any human to ever deal with and have to experience but man it is scary out there but yeah hopefully enjoy this reaction and yeah i'll react to part two tomorrow i'm pretty sure and yeah that's pretty much it until next time